Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. How's everyone doing after last week? There was a lot last week. Last week, we started our new sermon series about continuing in the church the way that the apostles and the disciples did in those days after Jesus' death and resurrection. We started and we dived into Peter's very first sermon on that first Pentecost. We heard how Peter described how God had revealed to King David about the Messiah that was to come a thousand years before Jesus even walked the face of the earth. We heard how God had planted this seed long before it would ever come into fruition. We heard how David wrote about this in Psalm 116. And we talked about the fact that David trusted that God would fulfill the promise that God had made. But we also talked about trusting in God's promise in the here and in the now and how we live that out. We talked about trusting that God has a plan and a purpose for this congregation in this time, in this place and trusting that God will use us. It was a lot last weekend, and it's not over. In fact, we're continuing with it today because our reading from Acts is a continuation of Peter's sermon from last weekend. In fact, today, Peter starts with a summary of what he talked about in the beginning of his sermon. He starts out by saying to the people, this Jesus that you crucified, remember him? He is the Lord and the Messiah. Wow. I don't know about you, but if I'm standing there listening to Peter, my goodness, I'm starting to really look at my feet. I'm starting to examine every little thing about them. Maybe my feet are starting to shuffle. My hands maybe are behind my back and I'm wringing them. Because the thing is, even if the people there had absolutely nothing to do personally with Jesus' crucifixion, when someone starts throwing the guilt and the shame around, everybody starts to get uncomfortable. And Peter... Oh, Peter does a real good job at throwing that guilt and that shame around in that moment. But what he's really doing is he's saying to the people, you've fallen short. You need God. He's giving them the law. He's showing them why they need God. And the people are starting to get it. Okay, Peter, we need God. So what do we do about all of this? In fact, they ask it. He goes, brothers, what should we do? And Peter has an answer for them. It's a very short, concise answer. Some might say it's overly blunt. But Peter says to them, repent and be baptized. That's it. Repent and be baptized. Whew. Peter says what he means, and he means what he says. He doesn't really beat around the bush. But, um, Pastor, uh, can, we, can we do that in the here and the now? Um, Could we actually go out and do what Peter did? You talked about continuing in the tradition of the early disciples and the early apostles. I don't don't really think we can do that, can we? You know, I think we've gotten a little soft around the edges in the modern church. We're really good about going, well, you know, mm, maybe, mm, mm." 
we need to go out and to start standing firm in our faith. We need to start being, in some ways, as blunt as Peter and saying, repent and be baptized. Because that's what being a Christian is partly about. Standing firm in our faith is knowing what it is that we do. But what does this mean, this repent and be baptized for us? Because it seems awfully harsh. Well, let's start with the repent. Repent, when you look at it in the biblical sense, it's not so much this beating up on ourselves, I'm such a bad person, oh my goodness. It's a turning around. It's finding a new way. It's not as much on the new Google Maps or the ways on our phones, but remember the old GPSs and you, you made a wrong turn? What did it say? Recalculating. Recalculating. That, you yeah, exactly. You don't think about it, but that's what repenting is. Recalculating. Recalculating. Finding a new way. Repentance is about changing the direction that we're going. It's seeing where our current path is, is leading us and saying, is that really where I want to end up? And then deciding how we're going to live our lives in relationship to that. But this being baptized, I don't know about you guys, but I was baptized as a baby. And in the Lutheran Church, we believe in one faith, one baptism, one Lord. We don't re-baptize. Your one baptism is good for your whole life. So how can we repent and then be baptized? It's already done. Well, we have this wonderful thing called affirmation of baptism. And you can affirm your baptism as many times as you want. Oftentimes, we think of affirmation of baptism as only happening at confirmation. But you can affirm your baptism every day if, as you, if you want. So, here's the pop quiz part of our service today. Who remembers when you affirmed your baptism? And the only one off the hook is David because he's not affirmed his baptism yet. What you promised to do when you affirmed your baptism. There are five things. Anybody remember? Read the okay. All right. It's okay. You're in good company. I can't even remember them all. So, you're good. I had to pull out the ELW. So you're in good company. And I go over this every year. <laughs> so a reading from the Evangelical Lutheran Worship Hymnal. It says, when you affirm your baptism, you promise to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Those five things. That is what all of us, in some way, shape, or form, promised to do when we affirmed our baptisms. Now, we finished the pop quiz. Now it's time for the confessional. How many of us do a really good job at living those out on a regular basis. Yeah, no, not me either. I mess up all the time. I don't live those out as well as I would like to live those out. That's where we get at the repent and be baptized. It's not getting baptized over and over again, but it is returning to our baptismal promise returning to our baptismal vocation and living that out. That is what it means to continue standing firm in our faith. 
That is what Peter was getting at when he's talking with those who are gathered there on that Pentecost. For when we think about it, when we stand firm in our faith, it gives us something that roots us. It gives us something that keeps us in a place when all of the winds of the world try to blow us around. For when we have deep roots, for when we have something that holds us, all of the things that happen are not able to blow us over. Repent and be baptized. Recalculate where you're going in your life. Return to your baptismal promises. Live those out. Know that you receive the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. For we know that Christ died, Christ rose, and Christ is coming again. Know that in his death on the cross, Christ died for you. That in his dying for you, the chains that held you to sin and death were broken. And that you are granted the gift of life with God. So stand firm in your faith, not only trusting in the promise of God, but standing firm in living out that faith in the world around us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.